Good morning, Redeemer. How are you all doing? I have to admit something to you. I'm starting to miss you. Um, let's try to stay in contact with each other best we can in these days. And I certainly would invite you uh, at any time to uh, reach out um, through a telephone call or text or email or whatever it might be, uh, just to visit or uh, if there's anything that we can do to help a situation, uh, just let us know. Um, I'm gonna give you this morning a few texts. Uh, well, let me start by just by sharing this with you because we're going through some unprecedented experiences right now and we're all trying to figure out how to navigate through this. But the one thing that I do know, there's a lot we don't know. One thing I do know is that God said he's with us. He never leaves us. And in Psalm 46, verse 1, it says he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. So take advantage of that. Um, be mindful of that, no matter what today or tomorrow brings. I also want to share with you a couple of verses in Psalm 138 as we begin. Um, and, and as I read this, just remember that you are the work of God's hand. You are his handiwork. And keep that in mind as you hear these words. And this uh, from Psalm 138, verses 7 and 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against my enemies and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Then I'm going to give you, and if you have a pencil, just write these down, because I'm not going to read all of these this morning, but some support texts to today's message. Um, the first from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 7. And I would invite you to read that and just spend some time using that passage kind of as your uh, confession. Um, we're going to be talking about our flesh today. So use this as your confession, but find also in, these, in this passage God's promise of forgiveness, his absolution when we come before him. So Psalm 51, 1 to 7, and then the supporting gospel text is from John, the first chapter, uh, verses 9 through 17, and just the reminder of how G God came to us in flesh. That's important for what we're talking about today. So John 1, 9 to 17. Um, I'm going to read for you then from Romans 7, and this is the text that will kind of speak directly to the message today. Um, and as I read this, uh, the context of it is uh, Paul had just explained how God's law is perfect and holy and righteous and good, but how it, when it became known to us, it exposed our unholiness and our unrighteousness and our uh, lack of goodness in us, and therefore pronounces our condemnation of death. So I'm, I'm picking it up at that point as we go to verse 12. And he says, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I don't want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? 
from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. I don't know if you see me or not, church. My computer screen is uh, going into a, a blackout here and I'm just waiting for it to come back. So if you see me, my forgiveness. Um, I'll be with you momentarily here. says I'm still recording, so I'm going to pause for a moment. Okay, my apologies. I hope I didn't lose too many of you for that. I'm not sure what that was all about, but my computer just blanked out on me. So we're going to pick up. I was just finishing the reading in Romans 7, uh, where Paul says, "Thank who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Um, to those who hold to a biblical understanding of sin and righteousness, uh, I think it probably seems obvious to you why we call the devil our enemy. I mean, he, he corrupted what God created. I think it's also probably obvious to those who uh, are students of the Bible how this enemy ushered a political and social and religious system into the creation which God originally created good. And what he ushered in was contrary to and in total opposition to what God had in mind and what God had planned. Now, last week we talked about how unrepentant sin leaves a veil over the minds of unbelievers, of, uh, of the, over the understanding of those who don't know God and doesn't allow them to hear spiritual truth. And we also heard how that veil can be removed only in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're going to wrap up this series on uh, called Behind Enemy Lines. And we're going to look at how sin has impacted our physical bodies, qualifying then our flesh to be labeled as an enemy of our soul. Now, again, those of us who have grown up in the church are probably pretty much in agreement with the whole concept of sin and, and, and the fall, uh, how it came into the world. But, you know, when we, when we look at the practical living out of this doctrine of sin in our everyday lives, it puts us in kind of a strange predicament because these bodies, these physical bodies are, are pretty important to us. And, and scripture tells us, be good stewards of our bodies and how we use them, what we do with them, take care of them. Um, so it seems to kind of a strange notion to think of our bodies then, our flesh, as being against us, even labeled an enemy. And here's where godly wisdom and, and insight is so important. Remember, we're talking about enemies of our soul, uh, things that are at work to keep our soul out of heaven. That's what we're talking about here. So how is our flesh? That's the question. How is our flesh against us, against our soul? How could our flesh keep our soul out of heaven? And that's a great question. Uh, Genesis, going back to the beginning, says that God created us 
in his image and he created everything good and perfect very good it says uh, including humanity so people in body and soul and spirit uh, were all in a perfect state when god created them now we don't, aren't told how long they lived in that state but apparently it wasn't so very long before they listened to the deception of the devil and they disobeyed god's word and we have a word for that when that happens it's called sin so they sinned and when sin was given a place within them immediately immediately what had been perfect suddenly became corrupt and imperfect and instantly death became a part of their reality don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil god said for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die here's the thing after they disobeyed god they lived a long time uh, and they had a lot of sons and daughters over those decades over those centuries adam lived to be 930 years old the bible says um, presumably most of those years after he disobeyed god here's where we need to be careful that we aren't fooled uh, adam died on that day when he disobeyed god at the very moment that he took the bite of the fruit that God told him not to eat. He died, and, and Eve did as well. So how did they die? You see, in that moment, their relationship with God was severed. God, God calls it spiritual death. It's the most serious kind of death that there possibly can be, um, because the spirit of a person doesn't just cease to exist when the physical body dies. It goes on forever, either either with God for eternity or separated from God for eternity. You see, the ultimate definition of death is not ceasing to exist. The ultimate definition of death is existing without God, without the true source of life, who there is only one, and that is God. So when a person is spiritually dead, the mind isn't any longer than able to understand God's truth. It's not capable of it. And instead of seeking God, then the mind of a person causes that person to seek what it craves spiritually out in the world, because it doesn't know to go to God. It resists God. And like the spirit and the mind, the body comes under the same corruption of sin because it's the physical part of who we are, it experiences a physical death. And that's the predicament that Adam and Eve found themselves in, and that's the predicament of every human being who comes into this world. Sin is always terminal, and it's hereditary. I mean, that's, that's a bad combination, church. Sin is always terminal, and it's hereditary. I mean, people get nervous about this virus going around, and rightfully so. But this virus isn't nearly as dangerous to us as sin. I mean, Romans 5 verse 12 says, Through one man, and that, that's a reference to Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men. I mean, there's no getting around it. You and I, like everyone else ever born, ever to be born, comes into this world with a terminal disease. And because of it, not only were our bodies faced with a certain physical death, but our spirits were headed toward a godless eternity, the ultimate definition of death. And that's quite a predicament, church. But then God stepped in. Then God stepped in. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Enter Jesus Christ into your predicament. Why did he do that? Because God didn't want you to spend eternity without him. And it wasn't an option for God just to look away from sin and pretend that it wasn't there. I mean, Scripture says God is just and he's righteous. And despite what people may have been taught or come to believe in this world, 
looking the other way from sin and pretending that it doesn't exist or pretending it's not really as serious as some people want to make it doesn't erase the consequence of it. Something had to be done. And God's plan was to substitute his own son's life for yours and for mine. And that means Jesus was asked to experience death, the same kind of death, uh, physical and spiritual, that every human being was faced with. But in order for him to experience a physical death, what had to happen? He had to have a physical body. I mean, that's what we read in John 1. That's why I gave you that text. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He had to receive a physical body. Uh, he was born in the flesh for the purpose of hanging on a cross. So when that time came, after those 33 years, when he had grown up and he was spent some time teaching about heaven, about sin and repentance and forgiveness, the time came when he went to the cross. The time was fulfilled. And as he hung on the cross, do you know that his spiritual death can be pointed to in the moment that it happened? And you say, well, how is that possible? You can't see something spiritual, but you can hear the result of it. Remember when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now remember the ultimate definition of death is to be separated from God. My God, why did you leave me? Why am I separated from you? Spiritual death. I mean, the physical death that he experienced is more evident. The scripture said, you could see it. Scripture says he hung his head and breathed his last. So he died the same death that you and I deserved. But there's a huge difference in the death Jesus died and the death that every other human being dies. You see, when every other human being dies, they die because of their disobedience toward God. Remember what we read in Romans 7. When Jesus died, it was different. You know why? In, in this aspect, it was different. The reason for his death was because of his obedience toward God. Remember that verse in Philippians 2.8, being found in appearance as a man, in other words, with a physical body in human flesh, he, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So now we can go back to Romans 5 and continue reading that point, or beyond that point, where it says, through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, so sin, death spread to all men. Now we go beyond that to verse 15, it says, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And it gets even better. Verse 18, so then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness. Now what was that one act of righteousness? It was the obedience of Jesus to the Father to go to the cross. Through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Verse 19, for as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Church, that's the message of the Bible. That's the core of it right there. That's the message that sets you free from death's sentence over you. And that's the message the world so desperately needs to hear and receive. The death that we deserve has already been paid. And all that God asks of us in order to inherit eternal life is that we believe that Jesus did receive a physical body. He came into this world in the flesh, that he died in our place physically and spiritually, that he was raised again from the dead physically and spiritually that he ascended into heaven, and that he's coming back again physically and spiritually to take us to be with him forever. But there's one thing we haven't resolved yet. If Jesus turned this whole death sentence thing around, why then are our physical bodies still considered to be enemies of our soul? 
And the answer, again, as so much of it does, goes back to that fateful event in the beginning in the garden. Remember what happened to Adam is hereditary, right? All flesh, Scripture says, be, became corrupted in the same way. And it's not necessarily that you and I made the exact, exact same mistake that Adam made or that Eve made, because we never had the choice of being obedient or disobedient to, to God as Adam did. We were born with this spiritual handicap. I mean, if we're, if we're going to be spirit, uh, politically correct, we'd say we were born spiritually challenged. But the reality is it's far more serious, far more significant than a challenge. We were born spiritually dead. We were all spiritually stillborn. And you say, well, that's not fair. How can God hold something against me that I inherited? And the, the reality is it's not a matter of fairness. It's just a matter of the way things are. That's the reality of our existence. And for those who ask, well, how then can God hold sin against me? The answer is he didn't. He didn't. He put your sin on his son, Jesus. And Jesus willingly took it. Remember the obedience? Instead of blaming God for all the evil in the world, and remember, evil goes back to sin, right? Evil is a product of sin. And sin originates with man, not God. So instead of blaming God for all the sin in the world, shouldn't we be praising him? for not leaving us in the predicament that we were in, the world doesn't get that. You see, it's not able to understand that. So let me ask you something. If, if you were to witness a physical resurrection, I mean, say you witnessed what Lazarus went through. I mean, he had been dead four days, and you witnessed that body, dead four days, coming out of the grave alive again. You'd marvel at that, wouldn't you? I mean, who wouldn't? What about raising a spirit back to life? Would you marvel at that in the same way? Probably not, because the reality is we don't see what happens in the spiritual like we see what happens. We're, we're very physically oriented. We, we respond to, we react to what happens in the, in the physical. So a lot of the spiritual goes unnoticed, undetected. But I can tell you this, those who see spiritual things marvel when they see a spiritual raising from the dead. Jesus said, I tell you this, there's great joy in heaven amongst the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You see, they can see. They see what's happening down here. And all of heaven erupts in praise because they see a spiritual resurrection, which by the way, is a far more significant miracle than a, than a physical resurrection. Here's why a physical resurrection would give a person a few more years in this temporary physical existence. A spiritual resurrection gives person, a person eternal life. Romans 8, 5 says, those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. I really believe this, church, especially in the times we're living in right now. God is imploring us to become more focused on spiritual things. Can we take that, that challenge from God? Uh, the reality is he is still giving new life. He is still giving spirits new life even when those spirits are still living in bodies of corrupted flesh now he doesn't I, I think it's evident he doesn't renew our flesh in this life but when you're given spiritual life you know what you receive with it you receive the promise you receive the guarantee of a renewing of your body to a perfect state again in a day yet to come that comes with the spirit the Bible says the Spirit is the guarantee that God gives you of that promise being fulfilled someday. Romans 8.23 says to those who are spiritually alive, we uh, wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. You know, when Jesus was talking, a lot of people are talking about this today, when Jesus was talking about all the things that have to happen before Jesus returns again, all the events that are, that are going to take place on the earth, 
You know what he says? He says, when you see those things start to happen, look up. Why? Because your redemption is drawing near. Now, what's he talking about there? Our spirit has already been redeemed in this life. Your spirit is redeemed now by faith in Jesus. So what does he mean? Your, your redemption is drawing near. He's talking about your body, your physical redemption being set free, no longer being cast as an enemy of your soul, being renewed, being made perfect again. The fact that our flesh isn't yet redeemed is what makes it an enemy of our soul. And Paul expounds on this in the passage that I, gave, that I read to you from Romans 7. I want you to hear it again before we close. Verse 18, Paul says, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. Verse 21, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. I mean, is there anybody out there who can't relate to this? I don't think so. Uh, I know there are people who hear this and they say, well, there's obviously nothing I can do about my condition. I'm going to sin. That's just the way it is. But church, that attitude is stopping so far short of what God has made possible in us. Do you know that? At the end of Romans 7, Paul cries out, wretched man that I am. And that's as far as a lot of people will take it. They'll stop there. You know why? Because to stop here gives license to sin, and people feel good about being able to rationalize their sin. But Paul didn't stop there. He went on, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? And I believe the Spirit of God shouted into Paul's ears. I don't know if it was audibly or not, but I believe he shouted into Paul's ears in the moment he asked that question. Paul wrote down what he heard. He said, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, our flesh, with all its lusts and desires that are part of its nature, is working against our souls. If left to itself, it would keep every one of us out of heaven forever, spiritually dead. But God didn't leave you there. Remember that today. Above everything else, God didn't leave you there, church. He sent his son, Jesus, and he took your sin upon himself. He died the death you deserve, I deserve. He defeated death's power by rising from the dead, both, both spiritually and physically. And he sent his living spirit to you to empower you, even in this life, to live above how your flesh wants you to live. Romans 8 9 says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. You know, sometimes our most dangerous enemy is the one we know the best of all, isn't it? Here's the bottom line, and I say this not because I know all of you like I know myself, but because God knows all of us better than we know ourselves. Bottom line is this, in this life, we struggle with sin. We all harbor secrets within us that were they to be made known, we would be mortified if people found out about all those secrets. Now don't shrink back in horror from what I'm gonna say next. God knows about all of them. He knows about all the things that you would want to hide and you're consciously hiding, all the things you remember. And he knows all the things that you've already forgotten. He knows all of it. And here's what's amazing. Here's what's amazing, church. The one who knows you best is the one who loves you the most. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless you and we will see you soon.